boat. Hammer in the yard, water. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, you can use um, those sort of vinyl, you know, plastic tapes for this instead of metal tapes, uh, but they stretch. All right, so that's not a good idea. It doesn't matter at all if this is, you know, accurately put on. It doesn't matter how long it is either, just as long as you're getting rid of the... Hey, Benny, if I leave this up the top of the rig, you won't mind, right? Shortly. Sorry, Benny, that wasn't a joke. That wasn't a joke. Don't call me Shirley. <laughs> okay. So... The, um, if you take the tail of the halyard and put it inside the shackle with a knot through it, then when you've actually lifted it up to the top, when you go to pull it back down, you don't have to pull it by the measuring tape because quite often they rust and then you wind up leaving it up there which is really embarrassing when you've got 20 minutes to go to the start. Okay, so... Got a seven and a half meter tape here, so I'm not quite sure how far it's gonna go. Okay, and you sort of get most of the way up there, and you lock that off. It doesn't really matter where, all we're trying to do is avoid too much stretch by having too much rope in the system. Okay, so sort of pull the slack out of it, you know, with this. For this particular measurement, it doesn't matter if the force stay is tight or not, all right? Because all we're trying to figure out is if the rig is side to side in the boat. By the way, yeah, okay, we'll do that in a second. So, um, just made, oh, we need to let that down about a meter. Okay, that's not good. Okay, so you basically measure, just a bit more Okay, good. Basically measure exactly, just pull it reasonably tight, and measure it exactly to the top of the chain plate. Okay, to, a, to literally to a millimeter. And then remember that number, and go over to the other side, and measure down this side. And on the assumption that they're exactly the same, then you're fine. Okay, if they're not exactly the same, then the idea is that you take one, you know, tighten one cap shroud down and ease off the other cap shroud until they are the same. Okay, so that means that at least the pounds where the halyard is, is dead center in the boat. Okay. Once you've done that, basically you should have some sort of guide as to the tension in your in the cap shrouds. So you know you can sort of get this from either from a tuning guide or from somebody who's been in the fleet for a while. Um, but on a boat with inline spreaders like an Etchells for Hong Kong on the sort of on the tension gauges. Um, a number somewhere about a third of the way up the range is good. Okay, a lot of people tell you loads of different numbers, but this is 
that's quite tight, okay, because it's about halfway up the range, right, it's at 30, okay, so if it was about a third of the way up the range, like around 18 or so, that would be sort of fine, okay, so the windier it is, the tighter they are, okay, so it's going to be windy tomorrow, and the boys aren't very heavy, so tight is good, the lighter you are, the tighter they are, okay. So once you've got those, the hands in the center of the boat, and you've got the sort of sensible tension here. By the way, when you are checking the tension on your shrouds, um, it's important to know whether the tension should be with the forestay loose or with the forestay tight. All right? So it doesn't really matter at all. It's just a matter of repeating the number. Right, of being able to gauge it. Also important to know whether the chocks should be down. Because if you have the chocks fully in, you're gonna stiffen the mast up and you're gonna increase the load on the shrouds. Okay, the more the mast bends, the more the entire thing sort of wobbles down. Okay. Okay. At that point, the next thing is to try and make sure the mast is straight in the boat. And with that, you use the lower shrouds. It's, this is exactly the same whether your boat has got swept aft spreaders or inline spreaders, by the way. So, Impala, uh, J80, whatever, it doesn't matter. So, in order to do that, what you do is you just wind absolute hell out of your lower shrouds. Right, so just make them tight, 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 and keep tightening until one side is sort of silly. So in other words, we'd be reading, you know, let's say the same as the cap shroud, okay, on the gauge. And then when you look up the mast, it should be bent quite significantly in the center at the spreader roots. It should be bent to this side. So, as we can see at the moment, that one's loose. And if I were to go and hang off this one, you could probably see the mast in the middle bend this way. Okay, or the boat cup size. <laughs> one or the other. Yeah, sorry. Okay, once you've tightened up the lower shroud on one side, you then go and you tighten up the other lower shroud, and you look up the back of the mast, like this, until the rig is dead straight. Obviously just sitting here looking up the rig won't make it straight. You have to move, but you just look here and then you just go and tighten up more. And slowly but surely, it'll come straight. If at that point your rig doesn't come straight, then there's a maybe sort of slightly more fundamental problem. And the two major causes of that are that either you're the hole in the deck is not in the center of the boat. Okay, so when we bought our actuals in 2000, it turned out that the, the gate was about one millimeter that way. And obviously when you take them, the distance from the bottom of the mast to there, which is about that, and the distance from there to where the top of the rig is, one millimeter turns into a pretty significant bend in the mast. So if you have that problem that you can't get the rig straight using the lower shrouds, once you know that the top of the rig is in the center, then the first thing to check is to measure from the chain plate to the side of the gate. And the same on this side. And that should be the same. If it's not, stick in a little bit of batten or something in one side. If you've got a deck step mast, right, like an Impala, and you discover that it's off center, then you need to move the deck step, okay? The other potential problem, if it turns out that that is in the center, but you still can't get your rig straight, then the, the main reason is that the spreader bracket has not been put on perfectly, you know, symmetrically, okay? So if you imagine that we take it to extremes, imagine this is the spreader bar, okay? So I'm looking down the mast, if you imagine that it was put on this amount skew-whippy, 
right? When you, of course, put on the shroud tension, these are going to try and pull themselves in line, and therefore your mass is going to twist and it's going to bend. Okay? So, you've got the top of the rig in the center. You pull the lowers until the, uh, the you know, it seems that it's a straight line, but there's a bend in it somewhere, like between the fixed points, like the spreader root, the hands, and the deck. Your gate is in the center, but there's still a bend or a twist. It's your spreaders. Okay, it's very rare. Shouldn't happen. But that's basically all you need to know about setting the rig up for side to side. Right. Um, just while we're focusing on the side to side bit, um, when we're out sailing, um, the you know you'll you'll often see people, um, especially those who tend to be you know up the front of the fleet, when when they're out there sailing, going up and having a look up the mast, like this, okay. If they're very experienced, what you'll see them doing is taking their cap off before they look up the back of the mast, because then their hat doesn't blow off. When they're looking up the back of the mast, what they're trying to identify is how straight the mast is side to side. Most people are interested in how the mast looks when you look at it from the side and how much it's bending but interestingly enough, that is a much more minor control than the amount that your mast is bending sideways. So as, we, um, as the breeze gets lighter and the water gets flatter, and that may not happen at the same time, you know, so for example, you know, in Port Shelter, it can be very windy, but the water can still be very flat. Okay, whereas in Lama, it can be quite light and medium, but still very lumpy. But basically, the flatter the water is, and the lighter the wind pressure is, the less straight you want your mast to be. Okay? So, what happens is, you wind up with a situation like this on an Etchells, where your cap shrouds have tension, and your lower shrouds have nothing. Okay, the standard setting in the Etchells for harbour racing, where the water is super flat, is for the outside shrouds to be 18 to 20 on your tension gauge, and for the lower shrouds to move at least a handspan from side to side. Okay, so that's about 10 inches side to side. And it should be like that in the harbor until it's blowing 15 plus, okay? When you have your shrouds set up like this on the dock, and then you go out there to go sailing, if it's your standard sort of harbor breeze, like, you know, 10 to 12 knots, not too scary, not too boring, then when you sheet everything on and you go sailing and you look up the back of the mast, what you will see is between here and the hounds, where the shrouds and the forestay attach to the mast, if you drew a straight line between that point and that point, then the back of the mainsail track at the spreaders will be about an inch to leeward. Okay, so you got that picture, is that, is that clear? Okay. We're not actually concerned about where the middle of the mast is. It's just a gauge for us to tell because what we're actually trying to make happen is not where the mast is here, but where the tip of the mast is. So for example, if we're sailing along on starboard, okay, then this, the mast will be, and I'm exaggerating here obviously, will be bowed out to leeward and then come in again where the shrouds meet the mast. So, if the, you carried on a straight line from the hands up, the tip of the mast would be over to the weather side. 
okay? Never actually winds up that way. The top of the rig is, of course, unsupported, and therefore it does fall down. But basically what happens is the mast bows up to windward, and then bends away again at the top of the mast. Okay? The reason for that is because when you have, if you're looking from behind, we're on starboard, if you have the mast bowed to leeward like this, it matches the leech profile of the sail. Okay? If you imagine the mast is dead straight, the sail leech booms on the center line, but it always goes off to leeward and then comes back in to the top of the mast. So in other words, it twists to leeward. If you set up the mast so that it bends to leeward in the middle, it mirrors the leech profile. So in other words, the sail isn't actually twisted, it's just that the leech is twisted, it's actually moving more parallel with the mast. So in flat water, and when you're trying to power up, that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve a low twist situation. As soon as you get into waves, or it gets windier so you've got too much power, then what you start doing is you start taking tension on the lower shroud so that instead of the middle of the mast falling to leeward, it comes up to being either dead, you know, dead in line or maybe even a hint to windward. And what that will do is that will enhance the top of the mast falling off to leeward. Okay? And the more the top of the mast falls off to leeward and the middle of the mast goes to weather, the more that the angle of the sail is not parallel anymore, right? Parallel, looking from the back. It's that actually the mast is permanently in a straight line and the back of the sail twists. And therefore the angle of the sail winds up being more like this than like this to the wind. And therefore it's got less power in it. Okay, so that's good. The other reason twist is good is because the angle that the sail presents to the center line at any point up its height. So if this is the, if this is the center line, and this is your sail, your, ma your mainsail on the boom, as it goes up the, s up the sail, it's, as it twists, the angle of attack increases, right? And then comes back in right as you get to the head. So about two thirds of the way up, normally at about the third baton, you wind up with the maximum angle of attack. In other words, the difference between the angle of the sail from the luff to the leech and the center line. Okay? That change in angle of attack is called twist. Okay? Twist is good when you're trying to depower, when you're in shitty, dirty air, and when you are pitching a lot. Okay? Because, of course, if you take the pitching to extremes, right, if you wind up sort of like this, then the angle of attack is radically altered from if you're like this. So as the boat pitches over waves, if you have more twist, you generally have at least a decent chunk of the sail at the correct angle of attack to the wind. Okay, so generally it just makes it easier to sail. But if you're ever out sailing in waves or in big wind, if you um, just get, keep going traveler up, main sheet off, so the boom keeps staying on the center line, but the sail keeps twisting away and away and away, what you'll find is it just becomes easier and easier to steer. Right? So the chances of, as you hit waves of the boat like stopping, you know, are reduced. Okay, so that's why the side to side bit is so important. And that's why you see people looking up the back of the mast when they're out there pre-start. And that's why on an etchels for, you know, fine tuning, the lower shroud is the most important tuning item. Right? Obviously, as you're sailing along, you've got your controls, the backstay, the sheets, the out, all the cunning of But those are trim controls. These tuning controls are the ones that you fix when you're on the, on the hard standing, okay, or on the dock before you go sailing. So getting these set up so that when you go out there, you have a look. Okay, it's an inch to leeward. It's eight to 10 knots. Good. Okay, is that, that clear? Okay. So that's the side to side bit. The, the relative tension, of course, the, you know, the, the side to side is not created by a specific tension of this or a specific tension of that, right? 
if this is 18 and this is 10 inches, and you in, it's going to sag an inch. If you then tighten this up to 22, you know, and reduce this to five inches, it's still going to sag an inch. All right. So don't worry too much about what your absolute loads are. Just make sure that you've got the relative load correct. The absolute load is seriously fine tuning, in my opinion. Okay. <clears throat> um, for swept spreader boats, like an Impala um, or a Sonata, or a or not a rough. Is a ruffian of swept spreaders? No. Okay, so for an Impala or a Sonata or a J80, the story is almost exactly the same. Apart from the fact that the absolute tension is a little more important. All right? Because at no stage can you sail around like this. All right? In a swept spreader boat. Right? That doesn't work. Okay? The swept spreader, the force stay is always tight. So that's why J80s can have roller frilling headsails, but anchels can't, by the way. Or can, can, but it'll be a complete disaster. So on the J80s, getting the cap shroud tension and the force stay you know, tension correct is really important. The adjustment of the lower shroud is more complex because it's not just a sideways move because of the fact that the base of the shroud is back here somewhere. If you ease it off, not only does the rig go sideways, but it also goes forward. So it also bends and depowers the rig, you know, in that way. So you ease it off, thinking it's going to sag to leeward to hook up the top of the rig and power up the mainsail, but at the same time it's bending forward, so it's flattening the mainsail and which, which is depowering. Okay, so it's a much more complicated and fine tuning, um, you know, method and much more like a dinghy set up like a 470, um, you know, or a little, uh, I was going to say a laser, um, you know, like a dinghy, like a 470, okay, or a 505, sort of thing. Okay, so that's the sideways bit. The, the fore and aft bend in the etchels is, uh, oh, Benny, your screws come out, sorry about that, okay. Um, the owner's in America, so, fine. It's a rental. It's a rental, good. Um, the fore and aft bend, is controlled by the chocks and by the position of the mast heel. So the mast heel on etchels um, is adjustable. It's on a plate with a sort of screw that you can adjust to move the heel fore and aft. Um, the heel position itself is not enormously relevant, is my way of thinking. Um, there are differing opinions about that. Benny, can you just pull these chops down out of the way? That's fine. Yeah. What is important to me is the distance between the front of the mast, or sorry, the back of the mast, and the back of the mast gate. Okay? Because what I'm really interested in is the amount that the mast bends fore and aft relative to how tight the force stay is, okay? So, for example, Benny, if you pull on the coarse backstay until this goes hand tight, go a bit more, all right. So, right, the, um, you can see now that the back of the mast is about a centimeter in front of the back of the gate. So if we were out there sailing, and we went to trim backstay on, let's go hard on the backstay, forestay sort of stays looking the same, but it's this bit that moves. Okay, so this just keeps coming forward in the boat. So you can obviously stick chocks in the front of the mast to stop the mast bending. Okay. If you had wound the heel forward, do you want to ease that all off again, Benny? Right? If, no, the course is fine, thanks. If you wind the heel of the mast forward, say three inches, then you're going to wind up with the front of the mast being in exactly the same place in the gate as it was a couple of seconds ago when Benny wound on 
300 pounds of backstay tension. Okay? But the base, so the, the backstay tension will be the same, the forestay tension will be the same, but the mast will be held dead straight by the chocks. Whereas if we had the heel back where it is now, the mast will have to bend before it hits the chocks. So the heel position is not really, you know, you know, people will tell you that the heel position will adjust how much weather helm you've got. Okay, that's bullshit. All right, for a start. Because of the fact that what you care about is where, if the heel is one way or the other, but the mast here is locked in exactly the same place by the chocks, right? It's the sail that creates windward, you know, weather helm, not the heel position, okay? So basically, as a simple rule, all we're trying to do is, if it's really, really light, what we do is, when we pull the backstay on, so the forestay just goes tight, we move the heel of the mast back, so the back of the mast is just touching the back of the gate. Okay? And then, as it gets windier, we wind it forward until we get to a point where I can basically, you could basically fit about two sensibly sized fingers in the back of the gate between the mast and the back of the gate. So about an inch and a bit. Right? So say, say two and a half, three centimeters. Okay? So that then, when you let the chocks up, okay? So you might let the chocks up, that's the mast locked in position, and you know it's going to be that straight. If, of course, you wound the rig forward, the heel forward a lot, the mass would actually be inverted back here. If you had the heel right at the, like if you wound the heel back, so that you were actually winding it against the back of the gate, then the mass would bend. Okay? All for the same four stay tension. So when I say I'm not really all that fussed about the heel position, that's largely because of the fact that I can achieve... I'm going down again, ready? Thanks. I can achieve the same position in the gate by having the heel in the same place and by changing the forestay length. Okay, so for example, if you imagine I leave the heel exactly where it is, if I shorten the forestay by two inches, I'm going to move... the, the mast here is going to move forward because the forestay is shortening, and therefore the, it's going to look like it moves forward in the gate. In the same way, if I increase the rake by letting the forestay bottle screw off, the rig falls back, and it looks like the mast has moved back in the gate. So the trick is not so much trying to figure out exactly where your heel position should be as an end in itself. It's a matter of trying to figure out which way lets you get the mast in the right position so that you can still get the force state to the correct tension when you're out sailing. So the simple, you know, a simple starting point is that when you, in light air, if it's the sort of air where you might just be getting to the high side, but, you know, you might have a guy sitting on the leeward side or a guy sitting in the middle of the boat, then have it so that when the force state is just tight like that, it's against the back of the gate. If you're all going to be on the high side, like let's say 8 to 12 knots, then about a centimeter in the back. And if you're really going for it out there, if it's really windy, then about three centimeters in the back. Okay? Okay. Um, what else is there on the rig? Yeah. Okay, so the force state down inside the, the force state there's a bottle screw down inside here. And basically, you know, the, obviously on a boat like a J80 or a, an Impala or something like that, when you adjust the length of the force day, um, you know, it also it alters the tension of the rig, right? Because in a swept spreader boat, the shrouds and the force day are always tight. In an inline spreader boat like this, that's, that's not the case. And so the force can be loose. So all you're doing when you alter the force day length is that you alter the rake. You don't alter the shroud tension um, at all or the force day tension. Force day tension is solely controlled by the chocks and the backstay. 
So basically, the general the general rule is um, to you know have your have your mast heel on the bottom somewhere in the middle of the boat, and then your forestay to something around about a middle setting. Like there's about a 46 inch measurement. The way rake is measured on an etchels is that you take a halyard. And you measure down to the top of the black band, and then you go forward without doing that, obviously. And you measure down to the deck, and the difference between those should be somewhere between 117 and 121 centimeters. Okay. Some people do things like putting tape on the forestay, all right, and that's a complete waste of time because somebody will measure it there after you've done one or two jib hoists and the tape will have been moved by the hanks on the jib. So just measure to the top of the black band and then measure to the foredeck and so long as it's around about 170 to 121 centimeters, you're fine. 121 is for light air, 117 is for heavy air. Um, on a boat like an Impala or a J80, etc. I imagine that for a J80 there's a tuning guide. I know there's a tuning guide. For, uh, for the Impalas or for any sort of big boat for that matter, I'm not sure if there are tuning guides. Generally it's more of a feel thing. You know, if you're out there sailing and you sheet the sails on and they look sort of normal and you let the tiller go and the boat bears away, then you need to put in more rake. If you let the tiller go and the boat steers in a straight line, you're probably about there. If you let the tiller go and the boat spins up to windward, probably take a little rake out. Yeah? Oh. At this point, are there any questions while I have a drink? What else would you like to hear about? Uh, Jimmy. You're talking about uh, bearing off, going straight, and when you let the, the tail off, uh, what wind speed you're talking about, uh, you know, the, to have a gauge of? Yeah. Um, I suppose, you know, you know, if it's below six knots, it's not really relevant. Um, you know, the, you know, different rakes are going to be suitable for different weather conditions. All right, the uh, you know, in in a in a in a um, you know, the amount of the amount of energy that you leave in the mainsail depends how much backstay you have on, how much cunning you have on, how much outhaul you have on, how many chocks you have in. So. You know, as it gets windier, you're always trying to desperately depower the, the mainsail. Um, and you start off in general with too much power in the mainsail. And the power of the mainsail is largely behind the keel. So when you have too much power behind the keel, right, so aft of the keel, the boat rounds up into the wind. So what tends to happen is, as it gets heavier, you you take rake out to try and in general move the sail plan forward so that you don't wind up rounding up into the wind. But in something like you know 10 to 12, you know 8 to 10 to 12, your standard sort of harbor conditions, you know that's that's the best time for getting us what we call a base setting. So in other words, everybody's sitting out, but you're not crazily overpowered. You know that's a good time. You let it go, and nothing happens too fast. You know. If it's under six knots, nothing happens at all. And if it's over, say, 18 knots or, or so, everything's just gonna happen a little too fast. So, um, you know, 10 to 12 is a good time to figure out your base setting. Certainly on the big boat, you know, base, you know, when you look at every, if you go down and look at the sort of trim guides and tuning guides that everybody has, their base is, is 12 knots. Jamie? Yeah. When you did this last year, what, the first thing you measured was the stern to the, was the mast? Yeah. Very etchels. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that again? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, you know, when we talk about the sort of your base setting for the heel position, you know, the, um, the, the measurement is from the transom 
along down the side of the coach roof, or down the coach roof, jeez, I've been sitting on big boats too long, down past the side of the console to the base of the mast. And that should be 17 foot six to 17 foot eight and three quarters. 17 foot six if it's really light, 17 eight and three quarters if it's windy, and it also depends where your gate position is in the deck. That's the standard tuning guide recommendation. I've sort of gone away from that because of the fact that many of the boats, the gates are in slightly different positions and because of the fact that the keel is up to 1.6 centimeters different on the various boats in the fleet here. So, you know, if your heel is the furthest aft type of keel, then you probably want to have your rig entirely a little further back. Right, so, I mean, when we're talking about a centimeter of rake on the force day, that's about four centimeters of movement at the hounds, which is about four millimeters of movement here. So, my feeling about a, a measurement from the transom to the back of the mast, when you don't know where the keel is in the first place, struck me as being perhaps less helpful than just figuring out a position in the gate and then working it off that. And we, we, found, that, we found that a lot easier to, to deal with as a sort of starting position. It's also visual. You know, if you turn up and you don't have a tape and you're, it's, everything's a bit of a scramble, you know, you just pull on the back state, force state sort of goes tight, you have a look here, it's about a couple of centimeters, you're in business. Okay. Right, so we now know that the mast is in the right position, the shrouds are the right tension, the heel's in the right place, we've got chocks that work, um, so then we put some sails on. The, uh, the, in terms of the macro stuff that we do on the boat, before we go sailing, the jib generally has got, except this one, um, the jibs generally have got two buttons. Does it? Okay. So basically when you're putting these round, there's normally I don't think we'll do the entire thing, Benny. I don't think so. But we um so we put this round, there are normally two clips, and one clip leaves that amount of webbing sticking in front of the jib, front of the jib, and the other one would be a longer one that would lead, you know. WD-40. Um, oh yeah, okay. Nice. Uh, that might leave, you know, maybe twice as much. Okay, so maybe a centimeter of webbing out the front. The reason for that is because that you're only allowed a limited number of head soles on etchels, and a lot of one designs, to be honest, nearly all one designs, for a regatta or for a season or something like that. So in the etchels, you're only allowed to measure in two jibs for any um, particular championship. So as a result, you might measure in a full jib for when you need the power, and a flat jib for when you need not so much power. Um, that's a fairly coarse adjustment. You know, and once you've got a jib up, you know, if it's wrong in the middle of a race, it's kind of tough to change. So when you have the two sets of tabs, what that creates is, it effectively gives you two luff curves on the jib. So if you go short tabs, basically it's, it's like, to exaggerate again, if you imagine that the jib gets stretched out because the front of the sail gets pulled forward because the tab that's holding it round the jib is not this long anymore, it's only this long. So when you go short tabs on the jib, the jib goes flatter and the entry angle of attack gets narrower. When you're on long tabs, the jib in general gets fuller, but a, prop, a more obvious impact is that the angle of attack at the front gets wider. So the sensible theory is that when it's flatter water or more wind, you go with short tabs, so a flatter sail, but in general our rule, especially for the Saturday races here, is depending how much you've had to drink the night before, 
you go long tabs if you had a lot, and you go short tabs if you didn't. Because it's a lot harder to sell to the short tabs because the angle of attack and therefore your, your bandwidth for weaving up the beat um, is reduced. So in the harbor, seriously, unless it's blowing a lot, like you're really, it's gonna be one of those days when you come in afterwards going, God damn, that was fantastic. Go long tabs. Okay, so that's the tabs on. Um, the, do, do, do we want to talk about the specifics of like rigging up, you know, how to make sure that this is in the right place relative to the sheet, that sort of thing? No. Okay. So, so we've chosen the tabs on the jib. We've clipped on the sheets. We pull on the mainsail. The only option you have on a mainsail is the top batten. So it's either, oh, sorry, hang on. On the jib, there is one other option, is that on a lot of the jibs nowadays, um, there is a full length top batten in the jib. If it's gonna be very light, like really, really light, um, it, it can often be a good idea to just get rid of that top batten. Just take it out of the jib completely. And put it in your kite box or down the transom or something like that. Okay, because you don't need it. And what tends to happen is no matter how light and flexy you make that batten, it just flattens the top of the jib. So when you take it out, the jib gets a little more shape up at the top. So in a, generally for us, in under about, you know, if it's weather conditions where you don't have everybody on the high, on the high side, and you guys, you know, maybe even sitting down to lure, doing the trimming, we'd take out the top batten. Some of the sails you can put a short one in instead, yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the jib. Right, then the mainsail basically your only choice is the top batten. So you either have a really stiff one or a really soft one. There's sort of no real halfway house. Well I haven't seen a very effective halfway house. Um, and basically you put in a stiff one if it's windy, and you put in a flimsy one if it's not windy. Okay, that's uh that's basically the story. We always sail with the soft one. No matter how windy it is, we always sail with the soft one. I don't know why, just always, we always are of the opinion that at some point on a windy day, certainly here in Hong Kong, it's very rare to get a day where it's always windy. There always seems to be some time when you're, you need a bit of power, right? Whether that's because of the fact that it's generally pretty choppy you know, outside the harbor and every sort of you feel like you need the power. And with the, with the stiff top batten, it seems quite difficult to get the back of the mainsail to hook up because it's kind of difficult to get the batten to bend. Whereas with the soft one, it seems that you can depower pretty decently, but you can re-power up uh, more easily. But I think that's just a personal choice. Okay, so that's the mainsail. And then we go sailing, right? Um, so, when we're out there on the racing, so pre-start, the plan is basically, you know, to do that crouching, looking up the back of the mast bit on one tack and then the other, to basically try and ensure that the rig is the same side to side. Um, that's very important and incredibly difficult. I'm not quite sure why, but it just is really hard to try and make sure that the rig looks exactly the same, uh, both sides. But I assure you, um, it's worth the effort. In the harbor, it's worth the effort. In Lama, we tend to have it set up so that it's not the same, both sides, because what tends to happen in Lama, and of course, you know, barring last year's class champs, which were ridiculous, because we sailed them in a westerly, but normally when the breeze is coming out of 080 in Lama, in other words, coming down out of both the channel or from Potoys, on port, you tend to be going crash, bang, into the waves. And on starboard, you tend to be sort of going sort of the waves are becoming more side on. So on, on port, you tend to be sailing with more twist because you're doing more of the crash, bang. So jib car is a little forward, 
um, center of the rig, you know, you'd like your port lower to be a little tighter, so you get a bit more twist, and then you go crash bang really fast into the waves. And on starboard, you tend to have the starboard lower off a little, the jib car back a little, and you're going full power because it's a lot of it's a much smoother ride. You're just sort of going over the waves like that. But in the harbour and in shelter, it's nearly always exactly the same both tacks, and therefore looking up the rig and making sure it matches perfectly um, is a really good idea. Not really a whole lot else to say about the actual. Um, calibration or the tuning of the boat that we can really do here on the on the land. Um, what else did we do last year? Apart from shredding a kite. Does that cover pretty much everything or what what else do people like would you like to hear about? Yeah. The, the majority of the boats that are sailed here, I think all the boats except Pandoras and Ruffians, the mainsail is bigger than the jib. Yeah, Impala is a little halfway high, and out a little halfway high, but most of the boats have a jib and a pretty big mainsail. There are uh, multiple ways of depowering. Um, some of these fall into the bracket of just depowering one sail, and some of them fall into the bracket of depowering both sails. I tend to like the ones that depower both sails. Um, some people do it another, another way. So, for example, the easiest way of depowering one sail is to blow the sheet. All right, that definitely depowers it. Sorry. And there are times when that's good. But in general, that's not good. So, um, for immediate response in the Etchells, um, <coughs> and in the Impala, and in the J80, and in the Plateau, the backstay is your number one depowering control. Um, interestingly enough, although the rigs are Different. The uh, the result is the is the same. The um, the interesting thing about the etchels is that the forestay joins the mast uh, quite a bit below where the shrouds join the mast. That's very unusual and is one of the astonishingly genius ideas that Skip Etchell actually had. <coughs> sorry, Skip Etchells actually had. Um, when he invented the Etchells for the Olympics back in 1960, whatever. Didn't get selected for the Olympics, but there you go. That was our game. Um, so when you pull the backstay on in the Etchells, all other things being equal, the top of the mast bends, but this bit of the mast doesn't. It stays exactly the same. The top of the mast, you know, every time I look up in the sky, because of the clouds, I'm going to fall off the side of the boat. So, um, the top of the mast bends, so the top of the mainsail goes really flat, and it also twists off, because the distance between the boom, the back of the boom, and the top of the mast has reduced as the mast bends, right? If you take it to extreme, if they bend down here, obviously the distance is tiny. But as you bend it a little, it reduces, and therefore, of course, the leech of the mainsail must twist open because it's still the same amount of cloth. So as it twists open, the angle of attack, about three quarters of the sail, changes to being like that. Which is the direction the wind is blowing. And therefore the power in the mainsail is reduced. So that reduces the power in the main, but leaves power in the main low down. Which is great, because it's not really healing you over very much. Okay, it's just power that's driving you forward. <coughs> What's cool about doing the backstay is that made doubly effective by the fact that the rig is locked back here and therefore can't just bend down here and the fact that the forestay is joined to the mast below the shrouds, below the hounds, is that the forestay gets tightened when the backstay comes on. 
So as the force here gets tightened, that is the equivalent of bending the mast. Because basically, if you imagine, well, obviously this is not what's happening, but so, well, let's do it this way. So the force here was sagging, right? Because there was wind, and then you pull the backstay on, and the force here gets tightened, so it gets moved that way, and so the sail gets flattened, okay? Because it gets stretched out. So for the same amount of cloth, it gets stretched and therefore gets flattened and depowered. So <clears throat> when we're sailing along and the bowman calls, <clears throat> you know, gust coming, puff coming, you know, puff on the water, bullet on the water, you know, whatever, first thing we do is just go back, stay on, and generally at the same time you let the tiller down a little. So the movement is sort of, you're sort of steering along like this. So you're pulling the backstay on and letting the tiller down a bit. So the boat rounds up a little into the wind while you're depowering. So you get to, you know, feather it a little, which takes away a little power. You get to flatten the sails a little, which takes away a little power. You increase the angle of attack of the main, which or reduce the angle of attack of the main. So that increases a little power, decreases a little power. And you take a little bonus height. And then as the puff bears up, wears away, wears off, you go the other way. So the backstay goes off, tiller comes back up, boat bears away a little, and through this all, the same heel angle is maintained, which is the important thing. So if it turns out that you're in sustained more pressure, <coughs> you know, like for example, once it gets to about 15 knots, maybe even more, maybe, maybe, maybe even less, uh, maybe like 12 or so, and um, we'd be going cunning them on. Okay, so pulling this down here, because pulling the Cunningham on also just increases the twist of the sail. Um, some people let the traveler down, all right? But I don't know, I've never had a traveler that worked well enough to do that. It always, the friction seems to be really painful. Plus, you don't get to tighten the force down when you go traveler down, it just, it just reduces the angle of attack of the main to the wind and therefore you know depowers that but backstays is where we go first. Yeah. Alright, yeah. Okay, so I mean you know like I mentioned in the first bit of the answer to that question, um you know the very first thing that creates any um uh, adjustment to the trim on the boat is the flow of information. So, um, when we have, do you want to go and sit? Actually, why don't you sit here? You be the helmsman, Ben. So, um, in the Etchells, um, we have the sort of slightly unusual situation for all boats here except flying 15s that we all face in, right? Everybody else faces out, yeah, on the J80s, etc. So um, the the field of vision, naturally, the tendency is for everybody to look there. All right, it just you just see them all all the time, right? So and so you, you're getting fantastically intense information about there. Okay, and for, not a lot is happening there. Actually, it's all sort of happening there. So th there are two windows. There's the window in the jib, and there's a window in the main. And basically, between the three of you, you need to figure out who's looking where, <clears throat> so that at all times, the helmsman, or the middle guy, if he's doing a lot of the trim controls as well, I've got a full sort of helicopter view of what's happening on the water. So the bow guy generally looks through the jib window, because most of the time from back there you can't see through the jib window. And it's also looking from about the middle of the main window to the back of the main window. So he's got that quadrant. Um, and of course can see up here, which is where the wind's coming from, the gusts are coming from. Then the middle guy looks through the front half of the main window so he can see that sort of area, which often is the boats that you are crossing. The, the, the boats you are crossing 
but you want to have tactical thoughts about them beforehand. And then the helmsman is basically looking in this small area here and is looking through the main window at boats up there that we are on collision courses with. Okay, so generally from where the helmsman is looking through the front of the mainsail window, those are the boats that you're going to have an issue with. So the middle guy also provides the information behind the, um, from the center line up to here, which of course the helmsman can't see at all. And the helmsman can see that bit from the transom down to the back of the mainsail. So for example, having a, a main sheet guy saying, ooh, big puff on Denis, you know, because he's behind you, is not going to be very helpful because that's where the helmsman's looking anyway. All right? So it'd be much, much more helpful for the middle guy to say, you know, Denis is on our hip, he's got puff, he's lifting off us. Unlikely though that may seem. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, so that's, 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 you know, that's, that's valuable information. The bow guy calls the puffs that are coming from here. Basically, the idea is that he starts calling them, you know, if there's some sort of significant line of pressure. You know, often in the harbor here, we see a big line of pressure coming rolling down. It's not just little puffs, especially around this time of year. You can just see it getting darker. Then he might call, you know, you know, looks like a significant extra line of pressure in 100 yards. But most of the time, it's just, you know, breeze coming on. Looks like a bit more breeze. You know, guy up ahead just got hit by some breeze, you know, breeze in five lengths, you know, coming towards us. You just see the dark patch on the water or you see a little boat in front of you heel over or broach or something like that. And as that happens, the, the bow guy is ready. He's got, generally the way the bow guy sits, so he's, <laughs> he's sitting. Okay, so he's got the, so he's got the, uh, you're a funny guy. There's, uh, so there's, um, he's got the, Coarse main coarse jib sheet in his back hand, right, and it's sort of over his toe to help him hike. And in his front hand, he's got the jib sheet fine tune, which is what he uses for adjusting it. This is only for holding on to for hiking and for when you tack. And then just next to him, he's got the jib car, jib halyard fine tune, and the jib tack. So basically, as the puff hits, you know, if it looks like a sustained kind of puff the helmsman very likely might call for the car to be dropped back, which will flatten out the bottom of the jib, or a little more jib tack to take the creases out as the force that gets blown soft, or if it's wild, a bit of an ease of sheet. Okay. The middle guy generally just has the coarse and the fine main sheet in his hand. So as the puff is approaching, you know, he might get ready for, if it looks like a big one, to do a bit of an ease of the fine main sheet, or to wind on some Cunningham to get it done. The out hole is pretty much fixed all the time. Generally, it doesn't really get adjusted much. And then the helmsman basically does all the job of maintaining the heel angle throughout the puff. So he's basically sitting there, he's got the tiller, he's got the backstay, and the word comes, puff coming, so have a quick look, see the puff coming, watch your timing, watch your timing, watch your timing, as you come up to it, Back stay on, tiller down, boat rolls up into the wind. Because you've reduced the power and you've re increased the angle of attack, sorry, reduced the angle of attack, even though there's extra wind, your heel angle remains the same. So as opposed to going <laughs> as the puff hits and then back stay on and getting yourself sorted, and then puff hits and back stay on. Right? The idea is that you go up the wind going exactly the same heel angle all the time. And so that's, that's basically the system of the information coming, you know, and this is just happening all the time, like just, just permanently. If there's nothing happening, if it just looks exactly the same up to windward, then the baggage just says, it looks exactly the same up to windward. Nothing's happening. Exactly the same. Steady breeze for a while. Because, especially in the harbor, as soon as you say, looks steady for a while, It'll definitely change. Okay, so that'll be, at least it's worthwhile saying it. And the other thing is, even if you're not sure about it, right, if you don't really know if there's wind coming or not, it's good to say something anyway, because the helmsman will learn to interpret what you're saying, right? 
So he'll get to, you know, he'll figure it out that you've got like a, you're two seconds fast or something like that. But over time, it'll help. It's better to have the information right or wrong than not. It's definitely best not to say lift coming or there's a header coming. Okay, because if you're wrong, you're definitely going to cop it, right, from somebody. Um, and and if you're right, you know, nobody likes a smart arse, right? So it's just better to say, looks like a puff coming, all right? And then the guy can, um, the helmsman can adjust to that. Yeah. Okay, so a little bit of a little bit of downwind work. Um, so the 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 upwind rig setup, um, you know, is reasonably technical. There is no way of presetting the rig for offwind work. Um, it's it's much more important to have the rig set up properly for upwind work, and then you sort of figure it out as you go along um, for the offwind stuff. So basically, when you come around the top mark, or as you approach the top mark, you put on the pole, you hoist it up, and then you come around the top mark and you um, basically hoist the hoist the spinnaker, and then blow the jib halyard, and the bow guy goes up forward, pulls the jib down, puts on the fraculator. Oh yeah, sorry. Here you go. Funny guy. Puts this onto the this is wow. Onto the hooks this onto the top of the jib. Um, and then goes back and stands somewhere around here as the middle guy gets rid of the chocks, the helmsman blows the backstay, and the rig leans forward a long way. The bad guy then just stands up here. And the bad guy should call the wind pressure as you go down the run. So if the pole's at this side and it's blowing, you know, your standard sort of 12 to 15 or something, then the bow guy is standing here on the weather side. So the boom's out there and he's standing here to help the boat roll this way because he wants it to roll to windward. And he's talking about the puffs that are happening behind, where the fleet is going, where there's extra wind. The spinnaker trimmer is sitting here and he's looking up at the spinnaker up there and he's talking about how much pressure he feels in the spinnaker or how light it's gone, asking the helmsman to heat it up a bit to get more pressure in or to bear away because he's got lots of pressure. And the helmsman is basically just doing nothing, to be honest, traditionally lighting cigarettes at this stage, even though that's sort of going out of fashion. But generally the helmsman's job downwind, if the other two guys are doing their job, the helmsman's job is sort of nothing. Right, on a good, well-sailed boat, downwind is a dream for an actual helmsman, in fact, for any helmsman, because you don't really have to do anything. You just get told what to do based on the huge sail that you've got up the front. So the bow guy tells where the pressure is, the trimmer or is coming from, the trimmer tells what pressure is in the spinnaker right at that moment, and the helmsman just steers according to those responses. So if there is big pressure in the spinnaker, you bear away a little. If there's no pressure in the spinnaker, you keep luff up a little. If the bad guy says, we need to stay as deep as we can to stay in the wind, then the helmsman will steer as deep as he can. If he says we should come up a little to clear our air, then he brings it up a little. But basically, that's the, uh, that's the plan. Off wind, that's, again, it's exactly the same in, you know, in an actuals, in any of the boats with a symmetric spinnaker. In boats with an asymmetric spinnaker, you know, it can often be the same. It's just slightly more difficult, um, and the helmsman needs to be much more sort of aggressively involved, because if you do collapse an A sail, it's a much bigger problem than if you collapse a symmetric guide. Collapses, collapsing a symmetric guide is not really a problem. Collapsing an A sail is a bit of a drag, because it's a lot of work to get it back, especially if it's light air. So that's basically it. I, you know, we leave the bad guy up here, you know, at all times. 
you know, on, you know, no matter what boat we're racing, just have some bloke up here telling you what's going on. It's amazing how much more you can see from up here. And the reason you keep it heel to weather is just simply because of the fact that the boat's a lot more stable. Okay. So you can only do it when it's above about eight, 10 knots. If it's below that, it's no good because the boom falls in, and the spinnaker collapses in. But as soon as it gets to eight or 10, heel the boat over to weather and off you go. What else? Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so so on the on the fifteen, you've got a you've got a the mast has stepped on the floor. There's a there's a a, 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 a a ram at the deck. You've got swept aft spreaders, and you've got a force aid that's just the jib halyard tension, and that's on a muscle box, like a purchase system. Mm. I don't know. I think you know the only thing I'd be sort of all that interested in, because you can't rake the mass for it because the shrouds are fixed, is that basically I'd be trying to avoid there being any bend in the mast. So you know if you're in a situation where it's blowing you know 15, so you're going into your bang sheeting mode, right? So you're just bending it all with the bang. Then when you go around the top mark, if you've still got that amount of force state tension on, etc., um, it's likely that there will have been there will be some induced bend in the mast. And when you've induced bend, that's to depower your sail going upwind. So when you're going offwind, you want all the power you can. So I'd just be easing the force state tension until the mast went straight. That's it. Well, I mean, I think you can, you can do with the power all the time, right? I mean, one of the things in the etchels about letting the rig forward is not just that you get it leaning forward so you get the head of the spinnaker over the clues, Right now, that is the main advantage of leaning the rig forward. But the other advantage is that you do reduce any, you know, utilization of luff curve in the mainsail, and therefore the thing gets really big and baggy. Right. In fact, sometimes here in the harbour, when it gets to that really unbelievably light stuff, like when we get some of those really dodgy northerlies in December or December or January, when it's awesome at shelter and crap in the harbour, then we don't let the rig forward going off wind because it's so light that you're sailing such a hot angle that actually having a huge bag in the mainsail is counterproductive. So I would just, I'd just work on getting the mast straight all the time. So whether that means easing off, I would imagine that a lot of the time that involves easing off a little bit of the tension first. Yeah, got a fast boat, mate. doesn't really matter. Um, you, can, you can bend these masts um, up to one full diameter inverted, and they will survive for quite some time. Um, so the, the important thing is to just get it as far forward as you possibly can, simply because if the spinnaker is like this, with the head behind, you know, head is aft of the clues, that is a less impressive facade for the wind to hit than one where the head is over the clues, right? If it's like this, the air, you know, this bit of the sail is sort of flat and is not providing a lot of oomph, and this bit of sail allows some escape. So if you put them right like this, then it captures a lot more of it. You know, I mean, the, there's lots of theories about it. I mean, the star class, obviously, you know, they put the rig forward, they rake the mass forward 30 degrees off wind. And they don't have a spinnaker, so it's obviously nothing to do with that that makes the stars do it. Stars do it generally because it, it creates flow over the sail. And in general, sails, no matter what direction you're going in, are better when there's flow going over them than otherwise.
Yeah, okay. I mean, I'm, you know, in terms of the out hall, basically, you know, unless you've got bodies off the rail in any type of boat, you should have the out hall on full. Completely full. Right? I mean, I don't mean go crazy, but it should be pulled tight. Definitely tight. If you, as soon as you've got bodies in, then, and you sort of, so you need more power, then you can let it off a little. But in general, we're never letting it off much more than a couple of inches, if that. Off wind, um, if it's lighter, we're definitely letting the out hole off. But as soon as it gets to you know, 15 knots, it doesn't make any difference. Because it's a trade-off between having a baggy sail that captures a lot of the wind, or a flatter sail with more projection. So one helps, you know, both of them help. All the other stuff, you know, at about reasonably standard, you know, the, the spinnaker poles, the spinnaker pole height, you know, just getting the center line of the spinnaker vertical, or at least the center line of the spinnaker parallel with the mast. If you've got the boat rib rolled to weather, don't have the spinnaker like this. Okay, if you've got the boat like the, if this boat's rolled to weather, then the center line of the spinnaker parallel to the mast. So, you know, if it's not, then raise or lower the pole, or pull on or off the lure tweaker um, until it is. I mean, I think all the stuff like drops and sets and the actual sort of mechanics, you know, proved very difficult to show last time. Um, it's easier to look at that on some of the video evenings that we'll have, some of the Tuesdays that we'll be running over the next couple of months. Um, and of course, on the uh, on the water session on, in December. Any other particular questions about the ropes or the where you sit or no? Okay. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.